Hi everyone, Bob Dietrich here with another edition of the ADHD Toolbox. And today we have Rick Bowman. And Rick Bowman is gonna talk about something that's a little bit different. And again, something you've never heard before, which is something called creative problem solving. It's a different approach to ADHD. It's been very effective uh, for Rick and his uh, practice. So Rick, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Bob. Really um, appreciate you letting me be here. Oh my gosh. Well, we, we, I'm excited to talk about your tool that, that you're offering here for the toolbox, which is creative uh, collaborative problem solving um, and how that works. But before we do, let me tell you, uh, the audience a little bit about who you are and, um, and how you came across the great uh, collaborative problem solving. So Rick is a um, clinical uh, psychologist and is a certified collaborative problem solver, solving trainer in a certified uh, trauma practitioner. He's also a cer certified trauma practitioner. So I'll get those words out of my mouth if I can. <laughs> and you're also licensed in Oregon and the Oregon School as an Oregon and School Administrator. Your, your background includes leadership, positions in the United States military, business, mental health, education, including speaking and consulting domestically as well as internationally in Russia, Cuba, and Jamaica. Um, Rick's also held positions of, of a clinical psychologist and director, a community college professor, assistant principal, uh, uh, alternative school director, student services director, and assistant executive director of a nonprofit organization providing educational services to students with the most significant emotional and behavioral needs. So you are right on the pulse of this, um, this area uh, in our community that needs so much attention by people like you that have such great information. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, collaborative problem solving. And before we go into what it is, um, tell us how you, how you discovered it or how, how you found out about it, where did it come from? Well, uh, the uh, process came out of Mass General Hospital in Boston uh, at, at Harvard mm -hmm. and uh, with an organization called Think Kids. And uh, we are, uh, my wife, I learned about it through my wife who uh, first became certified with Think Kids and uh, then she convinced me to do it as well because we were both working with lots of kids that had significant uh, emotional and behavioral problems and so uh, that's that's kind of how I got started on it and uh, and then uh, started using it practicing it became certified in it and and do a lot of training in it as well right so what is collaborative problem solving what is this approach Collaborative problem solving is a very unconventional approach in the fact that uh, we have a philosophy and the philosophy is that kids do well if they can or uh, or adults do well if they can and this is different than our conventional thinking because our conventional thinking has been more around that kids do well if they really want to. Mm -hmm. That oftentimes behavior, challenging behavior, uh, is a function of its consequences. That kids, um, kids are trying to escape, uh, avoid, or get something. And so uh, collaborative problem solving is, thinks about this very differently. We think about challenging behavior is sort of a byproduct of a child not being able to meet an expectation uh, because they don't have the skills to meet the expectations. For example, a child that might have uh, uh, ADHD, might be diagnosed with ADHD, might have difficulty being able to uh, do uh, multiple step problems, do very poorly in math, and uh, the traditional thinking around that might be, well, you know, this kid just doesn't like math and doesn't want to really do math. And it may be that there's skills such as an inability to reflect on multiple thoughts or ideas at the same time, working memory, uh, being able to stay focused, may, um, being able to maintain uh, attention, may, maybe having difficulty ignoring irrelevant stimuli and so on. And these are these underlying neurocognitive skills then that are not allowing the child to be able to do well in math. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of going, oh, uh, that kid just uh, can't do well because they don't really want to do well. When we believe that every kid does want to do well. And so in collaborative problem solving, what we're gonna do is we are going to, through a process, train and uh, basically teach the kid the skills that they need to be successful, 
to be able to meet the expectations. And this works both at home, expectations like taking out the garbage, uh, cleaning your room, those sorts of things. Uh, so it can be used by parents as well as educators and clinicians. And so um, it's, uh, again, it really focuses on uh, the training of the neurocognitive skills. And uh, there's a process that we use to do that. Got it. And, you know, in talking to so many um, experts in ADHD, what we've come to find is, and this is hopefully for, for our viewers, it's starting to change um, how you feel inside when, when, you're, when you see a kid with ADHD and they don't do something that you tell them to do. And then you think it's simple, like go clean your room, right? But for an ADHD kid, <laughs> that can be a difficult challenge. It can just be overwhelming and, and it can freeze them. Uh, so this sounds like this can really be a breakthrough process that can really help people, um, uh, parents or teachers or even people with uh, adults with ADHD uh, use it to overcome their challenges. Absolutely. We use it with both children and adults. And I, I like what you said, Bob, because even some of these very simple expectations like cleaning your room mm -hmm. take take some very significant uh, neurocognitive skills to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we, we call, sometimes when a child, sometimes what we have is a child that either doesn't have that skill or they can't access that skill at the time that they need it. Right. And, uh, we also see emotional and self-regulation skills uh, that also are connected to these attention and working memory skills. So for example, if, uh, we all know that if we are having difficulty staying regulated, adjusting our emotions, then that's going to really affect our ability to, to attend and focus and really going to affect our memory as well. So uh, this is all based on neuroscience. Everything that I'm talking about today is not a theoretical approach. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the fact that we know that if we do certain things that we can build new neural pathways in the brain for these skills that will allow the, the uh, child or adult to be successful. Yeah, I love it um, because it's so often misunderstood that, you know, the child is, is being defiant or he's a brat, right? And so yes. we put labels on it and that's just not the case or we, we think it's an intelligent issue and it's just not the case. So uh, once we can put these things in place, like what you're talking about with, with collaborative problem solving, then we can uh, create solutions so they can let that brilliant side, because there is a, often a high intelligence in, in there that, that if we can manage the ADHD, we can get to access that, um, that brilliant side. Absolutely. Um, you made me think of a story. I was working with a, a man uh, in Virginia, a husband and wife, and the, uh, the man, uh, the husband told me, said, Rick, uh, I, I want to tell you about my daughter. And I said, well, well, okay, so tell me about her. And he said, she's a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, she's a terrorist? And he goes, yeah, she's a terrorist. I said, well, how old is this terrorist? And she says, she's seven years old. <laughs> and I said, and, and he goes, I'll prove it to you. I'll send you a video of, of her. And so he shows, so he does, he sends me a video and it shows her rolling around on the room, uh, on the floor, in the bedroom, screaming, crying, yelling, and so uh, we and I we we so he shows this to me, and I said, you know, I said, yeah, that looks like some pretty significant behavior, but let's talk about what expectation you were asking her to meet. Well, the expectation was for her to read for an hour every evening, and his sister could do that, <laughs> and, and yeah, the sister could do that, and and right. and he said, and she can do that too because she's really intelligent, which she was highly intelligent. But when we found out through the process of assessment, assessing what was really going on, it was, it was, attention and working memory. She was she could not focus for long periods of time. She was easily distracted, and when we found out those things then we were able to address we were able to address those issues and dad completely changed i mean now he had so much empathy for his child now realizing that his child was doing the absolute best that she could do and it had nothing her behavior had nothing to do with him or anybody else is she was just so frustrated 
because she couldn't meet these expectations. Yeah, great illustration of, of how that works. So, um, so all your parents out there that are, that are watching, make sure that you um, don't confuse the intelligence or the, the behavior as defiance. They're not being defiant. They, they just don't have the skills mentally to push through. And let me just add to what you're saying, Bob, is basically what's happening in the brain at that time is that when we become overstressed, mm -hmm. we then drop down into the lower parts of our brain, our brain stem and our limbic system. And when, when, e when we as children or adults are in our limbic system or in our brain stem, we can literally say or do anything. In other words, we don't have access to our cortex. And so part of this process, too, is to help the child learn how to regulate their emotions so that we can get to the cortex. So, and that's where we work on these neurocognitive skills is in the cortex. And we do that through a process that, that the brain naturally does. So what we do is we name, so we, we try to get the child's concern of why they can't meet our expectation. Mm -hmm. And we really drill down and ask them, so help me understand why it's really hard for you to read right now, for you to read uh, every evening. And you really then, this is a relational approach, as you can see as well. It's like, I really want to understand. You're not in trouble. You must have a good reason why you're not able to, to read for long periods of time. And then the child basically, we help the child figure out what, what their concern is. And, and in this case, that I, the example I gave, the child was like, you know, Daddy, I just can't think that long. I, when I see the kitty walk by the room, I even have to look then. And then I can't get refocused. And so, and then the parent gets to share their concern of like, you know, but it's really important that you do the reading, mm -hmm. that you do the reading that because we're afraid that if you don't do the reading, you won't be able to, you'll get behind in your academics. And then the adult and the child work together and say, you know what, let's figure out a way that we can meet your concern of it's so hard for you to stay focused and our concern of we, we don't want you to get behind in your academics. And then the adult and the child work together to come up with a solution that meets both of their concerns. And in this particular case, they came up with a solution that the child would just meet, would just have some very short reading periods. And they did some other things too that would help the child. They took the child swimming a lot. They took, because anything that's rhythmic and relational and patterned and repetitive is also very regulating to the brain. So dad, jumps in now and says we're gonna we're gonna go for walks we're gonna go for walk and talks we're gonna go we're gonna go swimming together mm -hmm. and we're gonna work on this regu emotional regulation and now yes we're we're now gonna shorten these reading periods so that and that met her concern she was good with that and um and uh, it met his concern because she was actually working on the reading and sure enough this turned out to be an incredibly happy story where the parents actually said at the end of this that you saved this process has saved our marriage because mom was thinking dad was being very harsh. He was punishing the child because he thought the child was being defiant and the child wasn't being defiant at all. Right. And, and to, to go back to your point is that oftentimes when we see the behavior, we get so focused on the behavior that, well, that's dis disrespectful or defiant behavior, when in fact, how we like to think of the behavior is the behavior is just a byproduct, or what I call the smoke, of the child not being able to meet the expectation because they don't have the skills to do that. And let me just give you a quick example. If you saw an automobile driving down the road and you saw smoke coming out of the, out of the exhaust, you wouldn't go, you know what, we need to fix that we need to fix that smoke. We need to fix that. What's wrong with that exhaust pipe? No, we would all go, there's something wrong with the engine. We got to work on the engine. Right. So that's what the skills are. That's the engine. And gotcha. that smoke that is just that, that behavior is just a byproduct. If that makes sense. It certainly does. Um, so tell us a little bit about collaborative problem solving and how does it work? What does the process look like? The process, um, the pro it has um, three phases, assessment, planning, and intervention. Okay. Uh, and so uh, where, you know, you want to assess, obviously, uh, what are the expectations that the child can't meet? And then we have three different plans. You can still, the plan B is what we call, when we talk about a plan B, we talk about working with the child 
in this relational process that I just described. You also have a plan A where you can still, parents, can, parents, educators can still use punishment or consequences. Sometimes you're gonna to have to use consequences as well, but you can still combine that with these relational interventions. And then we have this thing called plan C and plan C is basically where we're gonna drop the expectation for now. We'll come back to it, not ignore it. We're gonna drop it for now. And so we, we do this assessment, we do this planning, and uh, we look at all of the things that the child is not being able to meet, the expectations the child is not being able to meet, and we assign a plan for each one of those expectations. Now, if you're a parent, that's not gonna look like this, obviously. But what you are gonna do as a parent is you're gonna be able to say, you know what, I can see that here are three things that your expectations that I'm asking you to do. For example, to get your math homework done. Okay, let's, let's work on that as a plan A or plan B, an intervention. Uh, let's say uh, 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 you run, you're running out, uh, you're uh, running through the grocery store. Okay, uh, uh, well, we might want plan A that. I might, so if you do that, you, we may have to go home and you may, we may have to talk about what you need to do to make sure that you don't do that again. So, and we'll plan B that later. Or you just might say on simple th on other things, you know, I know this is not really a big problem, so let's let's not let's just drop it for now. Let's just drop it for now, and we'll come back to it later. And that could be something you know really simple, like you know you're you're a little late, you were five minutes late getting home, you know. So we want you to be on home at home at a certain time, uh, but you know being a little late is okay right now for right now. We're dropping that expectation we'll work on that later because we have bigger things more important things to work on got it and uh, they do they build skills during this process absolutely let me tell you how the skills are built which is fascinating so think of any skill like any sports any hobby anything like that when when you let's say if you were learning to shoot a basketball um, and you never really shot a basketball before and, and somebody was showing you how to do that Mm -hmm. What would ha end up happening as you started to try to do that, your brain would naturally activate the neural pathways in the brain that are needed to shoot a basketball and put it through a hoop. Could be the same way with cross stitching. Your brain would activate the, neur the neural pathways that are needed to be able to do that. And so in uh, collaborative problem solving, due to the neuroplasticity of the brain, the fact that the brain can change through experience, what all we have to do is, is name the expectation. So help me understand why it's difficult for you to sit still and, and read. And when I do that, notice I didn't name the behavior. I named the expectation, okay, which keep, helps keep the child regulated. Now I am, once I do that, and I start asking questions about why the child can't meet the expectation, that's activating those neural pathways in the brain for the skills that are needed to meet the expectation. The yeah. brain just naturally does that. And so this is where the brain science really comes in. And the more that you practice that, there's a law in neuroscience that says the more that you, that neurons, neural pathways that fire together, that fire at the same time, wire together. So, so the more you think about, and you get the child thinking about what they need to do, what, why they can't do this, why they can't meet this expectation, the more you're running the pathways for doing the expectation, for meeting the expectation. And the brain just naturally, through that whole process, runs those neural pathways. And the more you practice that, then the stronger those pathways get. And finally, you see the kid being able to, to meet the expectation. In other words, they have the skills to be able to do that. Does that make sense? Or yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. And as you're talking, I'm 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 thinking of collaborative problem solving. And I was thinking originally that collaborative problem solving was was you know we're collaborating in a group. But that's not what you mean in this in this instance, is it? No, not really. Uh, you can do this in a group though. <laughs> We do it in schools where I'll sit in front of a classroom and bring the whole class together and say, you know what, as a class, it seems like we're having difficulty meeting this expectation. Mm -hmm. And you go through that same process where the group then can work together 
Got it. To come up with some ideas to try to be able to meet the expectation. And so what, what is the collaborative part then? What, what is yeah, the collaborative part is, the collaborative part of this is the fact that um, you, it's a relational interaction. This is all about relationship. The, even, if the, even if the behavior's not immediately changing, the relationship sure is. Every time I sit down with a child and say, you know what, instead of going directly at their cortex and saying, you know what, you have done this, this, and this, and you're in trouble. Right. Now I'm going, you know, I'm really just trying to understand why doing this is really hard for you. Help me understand. And let's work together to come up with, uh, with I want to hear what, why you can't meet this expectation. And when I find that out, I'm going to tell you why it's important that you meet that expectation. And let's work together as a team to come up with some ideas. And then let's choose one of those ideas and try it and see if that, that idea meets, that solution meets both of our expectations. Right. So that's what makes it collaborative. Right, and then, and then they start to build skills, and you have five particular uh, categories of skills. Can you tell us what those are? Yeah, the, the five categories are language and communication skills. These are the skills that allow you to express mm -hmm. your thoughts, your needs, um, things like that, your concerns, and as well as to understand what other people are saying to you. The attention and working memory skills, those skills that you typically see what we call lagging uh, in kids that have ADHD, uh, and emotion and self-regulation skills, skills that have to do with being able to adjust your emotional arousal level, to manage irritability, frustration, um, disappointment, things like that. And then cognitive flexibility skills, skills that allow you to handle unpredictable situations, ambiguity, uh, uh, you know, things that are, uh, transitions are very difficult oftentimes. Uh, and uh, those are skills, transit, being able to transition from one task to another or from one place to another is oftentimes very difficult for kids with ADHD. Right. And then we have social thinking skills. And those are the skills that really have to do with understanding how our behavior affects others and this issue of being empathy, of, of uh, demonstrating empathy for others. And by the way, we can teach empathy. We literally can. That's a neurocognitive skill. Got it. Okay. And so, um, so, can you tell us a little bit about how these skills are built? Because lots of children have um, been in skill groups over the years in schools or have therapy and may not have had, uh, you know, made much progress. Um, how's this different? Well, typically what we've done and is we oftentimes have developed social skill groups and things like that. And those are good groups. Mm -hmm. uh, they're good to have. Uh, anger management groups, things like that. Uh, but what you find in these groups oftentimes is we teach the skill. We tell the child what skill, uh, what they need to do, let's say, to play cooperatively together. And they know, so they have knowledge about the skill, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to put that skill into, in, uh, in, uh, they don't know how to demonstrate that skill. Right. So what we do then is, again, in the process of collaborative problem solving, we activate the neural pathways in this process for that's that uh, for the skills that are needed and uh, we do this of course through our that plan B conversation interaction and we do it in a way that mirrors the way that the brain processes information and so the way the brain processes information is from the bottom up so we have to regulate the lower parts of the brain the the, the uh, brain stem and the limbic system that's that fight flight part of the brain. We have to calm that down before we can get to the cortex. So we don't go directly at the cortex. We go at regulating the child emotionally first so that we can get to the cortex. Yeah. And so this mirrors the way that the brain learns and processes information. And yeah. what we've typically done in the past is go right at kid's cortex and say, I need for you to do this. And the kid is going, no, I'm not going to do it. And, and uh, we interpret that as defiant or disrespectful. And in this process, we're going to activate, we're going we're gonna to use a process that 
that mirrors the way that the brain learns and processes information and builds skills. And so that is how basically we do it. In a, uh, of course, it's a little more complicated than I can explain right now, but uh, it's basically, that's it. It's fairly simple as well. So I know you're also involved in training adults um, uh, to work with uh, children who have trauma. Um, how does this relate to ADHD? Uh, we're, well, the, the uh, well, uh, you said adults. Uh, uh, you, you train adults to work with children. That, yes, that, yes. Yeah, how does that relate to ADHD? Well, we just, we know this about kids that with ADHD, there's research that really indicates that kids that go with ADHD often go to school and they experience toxic stress mm. and trauma. In, uh, and, and trauma in a sense in that failure being, having failed over and over and over and over activates the stress response to where school becomes so stressful mm -hmm. that it's now a toxic stress. And they literally end up living in that lower part of their brain and limbic system. They're in fight, flight, or freeze mode all the time. And so how we work with adults to work with them is like, first of all, you have to regulate these children, you have, we have to do things that will help them regulate their brain, those lower parts of their brain and their limbic system. And, and so the way that we teach that is we really teach them there's a lot of things that you can do in your classroom and in your homes to help the child regulate because you cannot have, you can't build the skills without teaching them self-regulation. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I should say as well is we provide these small, moderate, predictable doses of stress throughout the day. Mm -hmm. This is very powerful. Even walking up to a child and say, you know, I noticed that you're really struggling um, right now with getting started on your math. I know you must have a good reason. Help me understand, how can I help you? And if the child were to say, you know, I don't need your help right now, get away from me that's okay. You walk away. You say, well, maybe I can come back later and talk to you about that. But anytime we make an, a, 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 an interaction with a child, even a smile, even a, I'm so glad you're here today. That is the dose of this moderate, predictable, controlled stress that actually helps regulate the central nervous system. And we even know that the data shows that uh, over a period of time, we can actually repattern the stress response if we have enough repetitions of this type of stress. Yeah. So it takes stress to, to change the stress response, but the kids, but it takes this moderate, predictable, good stress to, to change this toxic stress. Got it. Now, um, I know that you work a lot with, with children and, and the people that, you know, well, tell us a little bit about who would benefit from this approach, and do do adults benefit from this approach? I don't. Uh, every for everybody from families, from parents to clinicians to educators mm -hmm. uh, to para educators, any adult uh, can benefit from this approach. Uh, and and I can say this as the as the person that's receiving it from another adult. So, for example, in families. Uh, my wife and I, we use it with each other. Oh, and it's a great way to problem solve with your spouse. But the thing about it is, is that anytime, so you can use it in a classroom with children, but here's the, one of the great things about this. Anytime that I make a relational, I have a relational interaction with another adult or a child, and I help them regulate and help them build skills, I am building my own skills at the same time. Because our brains are, are interconnected. So we know from the research that regulation, if we can get, uh, if we can help a child get regulated, at the same time, we are actually regulating ourselves too. That child's regulation is gonna affect our emotional regulation as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's good for the helper and the helpee in any yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. A lot, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of these tools that we have in the toolbox uh, help across the spectrum. They'll help the parent, they'll help the teacher, they'll help the student, they'll help the adult, um, and everybody benefits. Um, so what's involved in learning the approach? 
Well, what's involved is uh, there's several different types of trainings that we have. We have a, a one day introductory overview training and that goes through, uh, it's like a six hour training, six to seven hour training where we go through everything from the philosophy all the way through intervention. Uh, and, uh, and then we have our three, two and a half to three day trainings, uh, which are designed to really train an individual to be able to do this and, uh, and become more comfortable using the approach. And, um, so those are the two. And then there's actually, after that, after you've done a three day training, you can actually do, uh, another more advanced training six months after that. Uh, so, and, that, and that's what we call a tier two training. And you, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, are they available online or do they? are not, they're, in, they're available in person only. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and one of the reasons for that is that during our trainings, you get, especially the three day training, right. which is what we call a tier one training, you get the opportunity not only to learn the approach, but to see it role model, to practice it yourself, and things like that. Great. So, um, so if, if anybody wants to work with you then uh, and, and learn this approach, you have them come out, fly out to Oregon, or do you have other facilities throughout the United States? We're all over the place right now. We have um, we train. We do a lot of training in Oregon. We train in California. We're training in Ohio. Uh, we're uh, we're, we're on the we're doing some stuff on the East Coast in North Carolina, uh, so we're we will come to you. Uh, we can figure out ways to make it feasible for school districts uh, to uh, be able to afford the training and things like that. So uh, so uh, wherever we're needed, we'll go. Fantastic. Where can uh, we find more information about the about uh, collaborative? Um, problem solving or CPS and don't be afraid about CPS. It's not the, the bad one. <laughs> and so where can we go to find more about collaborative problem solving? Uh, let me, let me, before I answer that, let me just say one more thing. There are some training or some parent training, uh, uh, trainings that are going on in the, around the, uh, Portland area or around, uh, the Newburgh and McMinnville area. And so if people are interested in that, uh, they could contact us uh, and we could uh, help get them set up with uh, a parent training. And a lot of these, some of these parent trainings are free. Uh, so uh, so uh, your question was, is then, um, oh, can you tell me your question? Yeah, I'm sorry, lost it. Sure. Um, yeah, I may have lost it too, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so where can we find out more information online? Uh, where can we right. uh, schedule? Do we go to uh, bowmanconsultinggroup.com? Is that where you have all your information? You can go to bowmanconsultinggroup.com uh, 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 and uh, our website, and we list the trainings that are coming up. Uh, if you just want to find out more information about uh, 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 collaborative problem solving, you can also go to a website called Think Kids. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, organization that certifies us and can just give you more information about uh, about what collaborative problem solving is. But uh, you definitely can contact us on our website. Fantastic! And uh, so we'll have a link below this video. You just scroll down. Uh, you can click on that. Go over to Bowman Consulting Group or um, or Think Kids and uh, you can check, check out both of those websites. Uh, we also have a link below of a free gift, a free download uh, that Rick is going to give you today. Rick, can you tell us a little bit about that, that free gift that you're giving away? Yeah, the, the gift that we're giving away is, uh, we call it a social emotional behavioral goal bank. And what it is is a template, uh, there's a template goal for every one of the 29 neural cognitive skills. Uh, that are taught in collaborative problem solving. And uh, these, this goal bank uh, is, can be really helpful in developing individual education plans, 504s, uh, behavioral plans. So it can be really helpful for uh, treatment plans, can really be helpful for educators as well as, um, as, as, well as clinicians, but also as parents, it's a, it, um, it, these are goals that you can bring to meetings for your child that maybe they're on an individual education plan and say, look, these are some goals that 
would be really good for our kids to be that you could work on. And um, so it's a, uh, uh, we've had uh, people really love this gold, bi gold bike. That's awesome. Um, so definitely a big value gift here. Make sure you go down and download that. If you have any questions about it or you need help, uh, make sure you reach out to, um, to team at Bowman Consulting Group. That's uh, Rick's email address. And you can get more information there. You can go to the website and uh, both websites below. And again, make sure you download this free gift. Rick, thank you so much for being here today and sharing information about collaborative problem solving. A brand new thing that I had never heard of before. I think maybe some people hadn't, but I, I think it's a very valuable gift that, uh, or uh, information that people will be able to use here um, uh, right away. Well, thank you so much for having me today, Bob. I've really enjoyed uh, this interview and I just really appreciate you letting me talk about collaborative problem solving and, and uh, how it can help others. Awesome. Well, I can tell you can have, you have a passion and you and your wife for doing some great work in Oregon and throughout the United States. So thank you very much. And thank you all for watching this edition of the ADHD Toolbox. We will see you on the next episode.